On behalf of the Great Lakes Vegetable Working Group, the University of Illinois Extension, and the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, we welcome you to the Season Extension Pest Management Webinar Series. My name is Jim Jasinski. I'm with Ohio State University Extension, the Integrated Pest Management Program, and I'll be one of your hosts for tonight's webinar. Backing me up and doing most of the behind the scenes technical organization is Liz Maynard, an Extension Specialist with Purdue University. We're also grateful to Purdue for allowing us to use their Adobe Acrobat software to bring us this broadcast. Tonight we host our third webinar, Pest Management in Winter Greens. For this topic, we have brought together four knowledgeable presenters who have spent many years experience working in and around high tunnels to give you an overview of winter green production, pest and mite control, disease management, and lastly, vegetable storage. Before we begin, I want to go over some ground rules for how this webinar will be conducted. The only people who have speaking privileges during tonight's webinar are the hosts, Liz and myself, and the four presenters. End of tonight's webinar, and I'll give you more details about that later. I will remind the speakers to stay within their allotted time and keep the program on track, and to mute your mic when not presenting. With that, Let's begin with our first speaker, Dr. Adam Montre from Michigan State University, who will give us an overview of winter green production and season extension systems. Go ahead, Adam. You have 45 minutes plus five minutes for questions. All right, well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, thanks to Jim and to Liz especially for organizing this and making all of the stuff work together. Um, I don't want to take credit where credit's due, so I'm, I'm not a doctor. Um, so I play one on TV sometimes. So uh, waiting for the slides to come up here, and then we can get rolling. <clears throat> All right, there we go. It's working. All right, so we're going to kind of talk a little bit um, overall of just kind of uh, season extension for winter harvests. Um, like Jim said, a lot of our experiences come from practical work for, for all of us speaking tonight, pra both practical work and re um, you know university research work. So um, we'll start here with the picture. This was taken just, um, let's see, three days ago at our farm at home. Um, you can see there's a 34 by 96 foot tunnel, and then there's some quick hoops in the front. Um, those quick hoops were covered this morning, so I'm glad to say that we actually got to it this year. So um, with that, let's get rolling. So here's the overview kind of of the whole, uh, our next 50 minutes or so, we're going to spend about 15 minutes on crop selection, about 10 minutes on uh, timing, kind of the you know when to plant um, to come after the what to plant. Talk about protection. We're going to talk uh, a little bit about a few things. We're going to say, you know, row cover, um, and then some quick hoops, and then some hoop houses or high tunnels. Uh, and talk some about the economics, which is near and dear to a lot of our hearts, because we really like to make money or would like to make money doing this. And then uh, we're going to spend about five minutes talking about questions and answers. All right, so here we are inside. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about cool season crops and, and what we're thinking about when, uh, when we look at those. So we're looking for things that have low temperature tolerance, right? So we're not talking about things like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants and cucumbers basil, although we do grow those things um, in the spring and summer and, and early fall. We're more talking about the you know low temperature ones. We also want crops that can tolerate thawing and freezing. So whether they're covered with row cover, whether they're covered with uh, quick hoops, or whether they're covered with a, a hoop house or a high tunnel, if we're not heating in any of these, we are uh, you know going to have temperatures below freezing. And those crops need to be able to take it, um, take that freezing and then that thawing again when it warms up. Um, a lot of times we're thinking about multiple harvests. For us in the north, where I think you know, most of us are located, um, we've kind of got two options for crops. We've got single harvests or multiple harvests, right? So single harvests, we could think of things like head lettuce or carrots or radishes, turnips, um, crops where you, you come in and you cut them once and it's done. Um, and then we've got the multiple harvests where, you know, you plant it and, you know, the baby salad mix is kind of the classic example where you're cutting it, letting it grow back, cutting it again, letting it grow back, cutting it again, letting it grow back. 
um, or things like kale, chard, collards, or similar types of greens where you're harvesting the larger leaves, or spinach where you're harvesting the larger leaves out of the outside and letting those smaller central leaves become the larger leaves um, before you harvest again. So for us, we like those multiple harvest crops um, because if we plant things much after mid-October or the third week of October, um, and we come in and harvest, we can't really replant. So, uh, and expect to harvest at least before you know, February or March of the following year. So multiple harvests are good. That doesn't mean that we don't do any of the crops that are single harvest. We just try to balance it depending on what our markets are and how much we feel like working that winter. Um, we also talk about direct seeding or transplant production. So some of the things like the salad mix, any of the root crops, um, we do through direct seeding. And then things like um, head lettuce or any of the leafy greens we tend to do to, through transplant production just because that means we can leave our winter or our, our summer crops in a little bit longer before we pull them out and put our winter ones in if we have a stationary tunnel. Um, that doesn't go to say that it doesn't mean that you absolutely have to be able to grow transplants or have to have transplants to do see, um, you know, season extension or winter harvesting especially. You can seed it by seed. Um, we do a lot of that at home just because we're not around that often and it's a lot easier for us to just put a seed in the ground than it is to try to manage with transplants. So um, again, it's, it's not an absolute necessity, but we do have some things where you're direct seeding and some where they're transplanting. Um, and then we're also looking for that disease resistance um, when cool and moist, right? So what we're looking for um, or what we often have are, you know, somewhere between 45 and 55 degree temperatures during the day in something that's covered and um, tends to be pretty moist. So what we have is really you know, nice environment for uh, especially fungal diseases. Uh, we kind of broken things down into five categories of how we kind of think of things for, for this winter for the cool season production. Um, we'll talk about each of these individually here as we go also. So we've got the kind of leafy or cooking greens. We have heading greens. We have root crops. Um, we have baby leaf salad greens or salad mix or mescaline mix um, or spring mix. Um, all refer to the same kind of thing. Um, and then some culinary herbs also. So when we're talking about the leafy cooking greens, what we're mostly talking about, um, starting in the upper left, is spinach. Um, we've got some beet greens. We've got mustards. Bottom right is collards. And the bottom middle are a couple, three different types of kale. And then on the bottom left are uh, uh, bright light Swiss chard. So I kind of think of those as things that we're harvesting. When they're larger, you can see that in most of these pictures, they're bunched. Um, sometimes we do bags of spinach, but a lot of times, you know, the kale, chard, collards. Um, sometimes we do mustard and beets as bags, but uh, more often we're bunching them. So those are kind of our leafy ones. All right, we've got heading greens or heading crops. So on the top left are a couple different lettuces. Um, those of you who grow know there's, you know, just like the. Uh, Innumerable numbers of tomatoes. There's also innumerable numbers of, of lettuce out there. So um, you know some of the ones that we've found really successful are especially that one in the top left corner on the right side is Hermosa or Adriana. It's a, a green butter crunch and it's just a really nice lettuce. We've also had some luck with romaine, especially um, into later December. And we've got uh, bok choy in the top right. There's just like the lettuces, there's you know bok choy and pak choy and uh, meeking choy and joy choy and, and all sorts of different choys um, that depending on your market may or may not sell for you. So say like for the student farm, we go through a lot of bok choy and a lot of those other choys. Um, but at home, our market doesn't uh, doesn't really want anything to do with bok choy or, or, or anything like that. They'd much rather have head lettuce. So that's what we usually reserve our, uh, our space for. Um, in the bottom left, we've got Chinese cabbage. And then in the bottom right, we've got tat soy, which is another type of Asian green. You know, root crops are another one that we tend to do uh, quite a bit of and that people tend to really like. So you've got some radishes in the top left. Those are Easter egg. We've also done Crunchy Royale and uh, Chariot, the French breakfast, 
um, Davignon, so a number of different radishes. Um, bottom left, we've got some green or some beets. Um, so we've got bull's blood there on the right part of that, and then we also do some red ace, um, some dark deep, dark red Detroit, and uh, uh, goldens also. In the middle, we've got carrots. Um, we tend to like sugar snacks or Napoli. Um, the top right, we've got hookeri turnips. So a lot of people who are growing those really tend to like them. Um, it's a fresh eating turnip. It's not meant for cooking, although you can cook it. it tends to taste more like cabbage, which makes sense when you cook it, um, but it's really meant for fresh eating. And we've done that, and we've done a Scarlet Queen also, which is another fresh eating one, but it's uh, a pink with red stems. And then we do potatoes down there in the bottom. We have done those in the tunnel, not over the winter, but uh, done them really early in uh, March and harvested them out in early May as new potatoes. And if you've got a market for new potatoes, those can be something that does really well too. We've got baby leaf salad greens. So here's just kind of a, a general mix. So in the top left, you see some red oak leaf lettuce. Um, in the bottom left, you see three different kinds of arugula. Um, in the middle, there's mizuna. Um, we've switched out of using mizuna, and we're using something called wado now, which is just like mizuna, but it doesn't grow back as stemmy um, on the second and third cuttings. In the bottom right are bull's blood beets. Uh, which we sometimes do for the salad mix. The student farm does it a lot. It's something that adds some weight and some, some quality and some nice color also. And then in the top right is something called Tokyo Bacana Chinese cabbage, which is a, a Chinese cabbage that doesn't form a head. It does really well, especially in January, late December, January, and February, when we start to see a little bit of cold damage on some of the lettuces. Um, sometimes people really like to have something that looks like lettuce in their salad mix. And uh, if it has cold damage, we aren't going to put it in there. But that Tokyo Bacana Chinese cabbage um, looks like lettuce, but it, uh, it stands up to the cold a little bit more. So we spent a little bit of time here on salad mix just because it's something that it seems like a lot of people are doing and are interested in. So you know, what are we kind of looking for with, with baby leaf? Um, these are kind of the main things. We talked about the cold tolerance and disease resistance in general for the winter production. Um, we're thinking about flavor, so obviously we want it to taste good. We're thinking about color, so we try to have a really nice mix of color. We don't want things that are all green or all red or just kind of all one color so it just looks, you know, all the same. Um, texture, we're kind of thinking about, okay, are some things crunchy, are some things soft, are some things hard? Um, we're thinking about size, so that's size of leaf, um, and we're thinking about volume. So, you know, if you're selling by volume as opposed to by weight, which a lot of farmers do, um, especially if they aren't using a certified scale, um, you're trying to get some leaves that are a little more kind of airy or fluffy. You don't want things that are all flat, so that uh, you kind of fill that bag up. So when you go to sell it, it looks like it's really nice and full. Um, <clears throat> and then growth rate, we're we're thinking about how things grow and how we get them to be the same size. Um, so we're, uh, with the growth rate, we're thinking about, okay, lettuce to first harvest is kind of four weeks. And then, but the greens, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and we'll answer Paul's question about what we switched to from Mizuna in a minute when we talk about that too. The greens grow to first harvest for us in three weeks. So if we plant them at the same time, what happens is we get big, are bigger greens and then because they're four weeks old and they're growing they're both four weeks old the lettuce and the greens but the greens are growing faster um, and they germinate faster so we literally like to have all those leaves the same same size so what we do is we plant the lettuce then we wait a week and we plant the greens and then when we cut them um, they all are the same size there the lettuce is four weeks old the greens are three weeks old and then their grow back is about two weeks um, they grow back at really similar rates. And that two weeks should be really, it's really important to say it's not two weeks in the middle of winter. It's more like two weeks in that um, September, early, mid to mid to the third week of October. This time of year, we're looking at more about three weeks to grow back. We know when we cut things right before like our Christmas, so mid-December to the end of December, our grow back is some more like six to five to six weeks, depending on how you know, sunny it is which for mid-Michigan and a lot of us in the north, you know, Pennsylvania, um, 
with other states is, is not always very, very much sun at that time of the year. So here's kind of that grouping. We talk about the fast group, the greens, the slow group, where the lettuces. Um, and then there's kind of that other moderate group, which it, they grow about the same. The, the beets and the, the spinach are more like the slow group. The Chinese cabbage is like the fast group. Um, but they add quality as well. So they're adding weight, they're adding color, they're adding flavor, they're adding texture. So we'll talk a little bit about harvesting here. So these are kind of our two key harvesting things that we use at home to harvest our baby leaf. So on the left, you can see um, just a little spring-loaded scissors. It's really nice to have that little spring load in there because your hand doesn't get tired pulling it down to cut. It's more that opening it back up if you're using scissors. Um, we got those for like $5. It's the OXO or XO, I think it's OXO brand. They were like $5.50. Um, they're stainless steel and we thought they'd last about two weeks and we're two and a half years later with them and, and we're now just thinking about replacing them. And then on the right, um, we just started using this maybe three or four weeks ago. We saw it in Johnny's, it's a harvest knife. and. Um, this is the six inch one because they were a blade because they were out of the four inch blade. But um, we're, we're, we're really happy with how that works and how it cuts. Um, so it's more it's serrated. You can see the blade a little bit. So you just kind of pull it through. We do have the Johnny's Harvester. Um, I think it's like 40 inches across um, with the big red bag, canvas bag on it. Um, we haven't used it enough to say yes or no. I know some farmers that really like it and some farmers that don't. And I think the ones that don't, it's kind of like any tool that um, the ones that do like it have used it a lot and tried it a lot and really figured out how it works well. So we're not to that. We have it, but we're not to that point yet of, uh, of being able to say we use it well. Um, so on the left here, you can see that's what we harvest, in into, harvest into. Those are tub trugs um, or tug, tub, chug tubs. Um, those are the middle size one. I think there's three, five, and seven gallons. So those are the, I believe, the five gallons. And then on the right um, is our salad spinner. So um, for a while, not a very long while, we spun out with a little hand spinner. And then we just said, this is ridiculous. Let's bite the bullet. And if we're going to do more than you know, two or three pounds a week, it's, uh, it's well worth the investment for getting the salad spinner. And that one's a manual one. I know they have one also that's a, an electric on there, uh, on the top of it. So real quick, here's um, just a couple little things about what we do for our farm for baby mixes. We, ha we have three different mixes. So we've got a lettuce mix, a salad mix, and a spicy salad mix. We'd really, really, really like to take credit as a marketer for coming up with all these three and, and being able to sell all of them. But it was clearly not by intention that we did it this way. Um, we started out with just having our, a salad mix, which was a spicy mix. Um, so it was green royal oak um, and red garrison, oak leaf lettuces, the um, Wado, which is what we use to replace Mizuna, W-A-I-D-O, and then red Russian kale. And then we also had arugula and red giant mustard. And it makes a nice mix. A, it is a spicy with the arugula and the red giant mustard if you uh, harvest them. You know, each time you harvest them, they get a little spicier. We harvest everything about three times. Um, and then we had, but we had people coming and saying, I really like the spicy salad mix, but my husband doesn't like it. Can you just make a salad mix? And we didn't want to get into this, like, custom make for every customer. So we said, no, no, no. We resisted, and we finally had enough people that we said, all right, let's try it one week. So we tried it, and then as soon as we tried that, it was like the slippery slope, and people came and said, well, can you just do a lettuce mix, because my husband doesn't like any of that weird stuff in there. So we said, no, 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 and then we, we ended up doing it. So now we have this lettuce mix, which is the green royal oak and the red garrison, the salad mix, which is the two lettuces, the wado and the red Russian kale, and then the spicy salad mix is those four, plus arugula and giant mustard. So I... Again, I did not intend this whatsoever, but what's happened is that you know, each one of these bags we sell is $5. We used to, when we had one type of mix, we only had one option to buy. Now that we have these three mixes, almost everyone who buys from us buys some combination of the three. So they buy at least two of those three, or they buy all three. So they might say, I like the spicy mix, so I'm going to buy that for myself and my kids, but my husband likes just the lettuce mix, so I'm going to buy that. Or they might get a lettuce mix and a salad mix, and they might get a salad mix and a spicy salad mix. 
So we went from customers who were spending $5, you know, plus whatever um, other products they bought, to then getting between 10 and 15 for salad mixes for the same customer. So it wasn't intended at all to work out like that, um, but we're really happy that it did. So we also have culinary herbs. Um, so we've tried a number of different things, sage, chives, uh, parsley, cilantro, tarragon. Um, what we've kind of come down to in the winter is the cilantro and the parsley. Um, they'll last all winter long. We can harvest them all winter long. We seed the cilantro like we do baby mix, really, really close together, and then bunch it. The parsley we transplant out in uh, late July or early August is, um, and then let it grow up there at 12-inch square spacing, so 12 by 12. Um, we get about three across the bed. And then um, we harvest it just like we do the kale or the chard or the spinach. We're harvesting the larger leaves around the outside and bunching them and then letting those smaller central leaves come out. We do a little bit of sage, not a whole lot. Um, we've done probably a quarter bed, which our beds are 30 feet by 3 feet, um, so about 30 square feet or so. And we more or less harvest it all out at Thanksgiving. Um, that's really the only time. Um, we've had it for sale other times, and really Thanksgiving people just, just go for it. So we just plant a little bit there and then and plan to harvest all of it um, at that time of the year. Um, the other thing that we're fooling around with right now is dill seeded like salad mix also. So we've got that um, that's about three or four inches tall right now. We're going to start cutting it probably in two weeks. Um, what we've seen where we had bigger dill last year is that it won't go through the winter. It didn't go through the winter for us like the um, cilantro and parsley did, but it more went through um, about middle to late December. So and then it starts to turn brown. It gets cold damage. So here we can kind of switch over and talk about the timing for a little bit. So here we're planting, you know, kind of early August is when we need to start in Michigan. So we go ahead and plant our carrots and our scallions. Um, parsley is going in as a transplant. So that DS behind each one would be direct seed or the T would be transplant. Um, again, you don't have to transplant everything. You can seed kale and chard. That's what we did this year. Um, we transplanted head lettuce. We seeded pak choy a little bit. So it's, you know, you can, you can play around with that. But we know that our carrots and our scallions, if we're going to have them up to size, need to go in in early August, usually about the first week. So it may be before the 10th. But by then, if we don't have them seeded, we can seed them and they'll grow, but they'll never get to full size. So there's a really good example on the right here where you can see um, mizuna that was seeded at the right time versus the, you know, we could say wrong time. So the picture was taken on January 18th, and in the top it was seeded on September 29th, in the bottom it was seeded November 12th. What happens is if it gets seeded for us after that kind of middle of October um, 15th, 20th, somewhere in there, things germinate, but they just sit there with either their cotyledons or one or two true leaves. So um, for us, we need to get things in. Some farmers that we've worked with, and we're, we did it last year at the student farm, and we're going to try it at home this year, is that, um, like right now, we've harvested out two beds of carrots already. Um, we're almost done with the bed of beets, and we're almost done with the bed of uh, head lettuce. So what we're going to do is go ahead and seed spinach into those beds here by the middle of December, try to get it to germinate, which it did last year at the student farm. We'll see how it goes this year. And then it'll just sit there. but in the spring, we come in and start seeding those crops in February 1st. If we seed February 1st, we have to wait for them to germinate for them to start to grow. But if we get them seeded in December, kind of maintain them with first true leaves or, or very small, come February 1st, what we saw last year at the student farm is that those just took off. They were ready to go. We didn't have that lag time of, uh, of waiting for, um, for them to germinate in those really cool soils. So, um, and, and then you can see for us, we kind of run through, and then by, you know, late September to early or mid-October, we're kind of seeding the last of the spinach, the baby leaf salad mix, the radishes, kind of those, you know, quick crops that we're going to, um, that are really cold tolerant. So another way to think about this, I know you can't really see it on the slide very well. It's one of the handouts um, that, that you have or that are, is available on the website. 
Um, this is more another way to think about it. This kind of works well in my head. Um, it's important to say that the cultivars on here are clearly not the only cultivars that work. They're just ones that we've had experience with and feel comfortable recommending. So um, if we just read across the trap, you can see you know, there's crop, then there's cultivar. There's that direct seed or transplant that we talked about. There's the seed date. So for transplant crops, that's the seed date that it would be seeded in a heated area. Um, for direct seeded crops, obviously, that would be when it was direct seeded. Um, the next one is calendar week. So a lot of us have kind of experience in floriculture industry, and this is how scheduling is done there, so that week one is January 1, week two is January 8, week three is January 15, um, all the way through 52. So for me personally, I do a, lot, a whole lot better if I have a seven-day window where I can get it in as opposed to a you know, one-day window of that seed date. Um, and then there's a scheduled transplant date, and then week of the year is the same as calendar year. It's just two names to refer to the same thing. All right, so before we hop into here, um, why don't we just look at real quickly at the, a couple questions that came across on the, the salad mix. There were a few of them here that are asking bags. Um, so we don't have a certified scale. We sell by... Um, by bag. Our bags, depending on the time of the year, range from 8 ounces in the summer um, to 4 ounces in the winter, and they're always $5. So something that we learned from, uh, again, nothing we want to take credit for, but something we learned from Paul and Sandy Arnold out in, uh, in New York is that they kind of do that where it's always the same price, but depending on the time of the year, the volume changes. So in winter, when it's really cold, there's limited product, um, it's really premium. It's a little bit more. It's you know five dollars for four ounces is about twenty dollars a pound. We're not in a high end market. I think that's important to say. Um, we're at a you know lower middle to middle class community where we sell. Um, and then in the summer when things are growing outside, it's outside of the hoop house. It's outside of any of the quick coops. That it's um, you know more volume for that size. So that was the one, what size of our bags. And we use uh, 10 by 14 inch bags without uh, a zipper top. So it's roughly a gallon, gallon bag without a zipper or without a Ziploc top. Um, and then we do you, question, do we wash everything before selling it? So we sell things as unwashed um, as part of our, you know, keeping with the Department of Michigan Department of Agriculture, we aren't selling things as ready to eat. That's really important to, for us because then it needs to be done in a, a certified kitchen. So we sell it as unwashed, although we do send it through the salad spinner um, to get thing, to get any of the, the soil off of it that may be on there and to kind of clean it up and freshen it up also. All right, so let's switch to protection. So there's a picture you can see that, uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your outlook, we're going to be seeing pretty soon. So um, it's kind of, like we said, three things that we think about for, for protection. We've got some row cover there, which you can see a picture of. It's a spun polypropylene, so I uh, think of it like, it's like Tyvek for your house, but a lot lighter weight, or like um, plastic cotton candy is another way to think about it. So... Um, we use Agribond 19. Um, I don't, we've used Reme. We've used uh, you know, a number of different companies. I don't think that, that the company is that, that different, but we use the, the second lightest weight, so it's 0.55 ounces per square yard. So it's just the, the one um, above the insect, or one heavier than the insect protection. So then we've got low tunnels or quick hoops. Um, again, those are now covered at home, which is a nice thing to see. Um, and then, uh, uh, but the picture was taken with them off also so you could see you know, what, that, what those quick hoops are. So it's just EMT conduit. They were bent, bent using um, the Lost Creek Farms bender um, that you can get through either their website or through Johnny's. Also, it's, uh, these are the six foot, they're six foot wide there um, at the base. So you can see three rows of Swiss chard growing in there. And then the one off to the right, there's uh, mostly spinach and then maybe 12 feet or so of broccoli rob at the end that we're trying for the first time this year. Um, there's a question of do we fertilize winter crops? So for us, we um, 
use compost as our real only source of fertility um, at both the student farm. We have used a little bit at home when we first got it started of the Bradfield alfalfa fertilizer. We've also used some chicken-based um, composted fertilizer um, early on, but for the most part now we're using compost and we're putting in roughly um, one cubic foot per every five square feet of production space. Or that works out to four, well, five cubic feet per every hundred square feet of production space. And a standard wheelbarrow is four cubic feet. So if that gives, you know, the one wheel, kind of low handled, low side. Um, so if that kind of gives you a little bit idea, one of those plus another quarter per hundred square feet. So kind of got the row cover, which could just go out in the field, laid on top of things. We've got the quick hoops that kind of brings that up a little bit. Um, or low tunnels, and then we've got kind of the hoop house. So this is what pretty much what our hoop house looks like right now. This was taken three days ago. We've harvested a bit out of it, but um, for the most part, that's what it's looking like. So for us, this far north, um, almost every farmer I know or have worked with, except for one, covers in the winter. Um, and there's lots of different ways to cover. So we can talk about covering with um, uh, row cover, or the, like we have here, we can talk about covering with internal or covering individual beds. We've gone with covering the larger space with you know more of a single piece or more of a big piece. Kind of think of it as like a mitten versus a glove, where this would be like a mitten, um, and individual beds covering them would be like a glove. Gloves are warm. Gloves last through the winter. Um, you know, gloves definitely keep your hands warm, but you have more surface area to lose heat from. So we've gone with kind of this approach to, to try to minimize the surface area compared to the, um, the square footage covered so that we're hopefully losing less heat. Um, so for us, we run high tensile wires end to end. So look something like that. You can see some of those wires. And then we cover actually with three individual pieces. We have them covered with those three pieces so that if we want to get to the middle, we don't have to push things all the way, push that cover open all the way from one end to the middle. So we really only have to move that cover um, two or three beds in any direction to get to the beds. So what they are is it's a 30 foot wide house, I'm sorry, it's a 34 foot wide house with 30 foot wide long beds and then it's 96 feet long um, with a, we have a storage area in the front so it ends up being about 85 or 84 square um, feet long. So each of our pieces there are 40 feet by 30 feet, with the 40 feet running the short distance across the house. So it comes up on the side, goes across, and drops down, and then we overlap them. You can see, I think in the next one, yeah, so you can see there on sunny days, we do kind of try to push it open if we're around. Um, and then you can see some of the wires as well. So there's four high tinsel wires running end to end. The two outside ones are on the edge of the bed. Then there's about 10 feet between each of the, the um, eight to ten feet between each of the wires coming across. And using that lightweight fabric, um, that supports it. You know, those wires are run 96 feet. They're hooked into the end walls, um, and they're just run the whole way and tensioned up. So it supports the row cover. We've also done some stuff with um, the plastic covering inside, which I think works. But for us, not being there all the time, we need to have this breathable um, material, the row cover. I think the, the, pl the poly is definitely warmer. The, or the plastic, but um, we are there all the time, so it would overheat pretty quickly. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, making it pay, right? We are, most of us at least are in the business to, to at least make some money doing this. Um, so kind of ask yourselves, well, why do we sell in the winter, right? So we're talking about increased farm sales. Now, a lot of times people say, well, isn't it really hard to, you know, we kind of have this idea in our head, and I had it when we first started doing this, of, well, it's going to be hard to grow in the winter. It's cold. And it was pointed out to me, well, you know what? There's no weeding. There's very few insects. Um, management is less. So, and then the other thing that someone pointed out that was really nice is if we think about, say, head lettuce, and we want to have, you know, 100 heads of head lettuce to take to market every week on well, the spring, summer, and fall, we can't plant those all the time, right? Or at the same time, we have to have those um, in succession plant or succession plantings. So we go, you know, 
120 this week, 120 next week, 120 the week after, or every two weeks. Um, but for us, it's really nice if we want 600 heads to sell over an eight-week period. We just plant all 600 of them on September 15th, and, and we're done planting. So um, there's there's less management and less need to be in there. And then we do one big weeding. Um, usually, we missed it this year. We try to do it the first week in November. We're probably going to do it next week, where we'll come in, weed everything really, really well, and then the weeds don't stop growing, but they are much slower growing. So we've got increased value and mostly linked to decreased local supply as well, so we can sell our products for more. So two quick questions. Um, reasons for our rows running the short distance across? Mostly because of, well, two reasons. One is because of um, the way we think about rotation and the number of different crops that we grow. We treat almost each individual bed like it's a field, so we have you know rotation history for each bed. And it's easy to, to then plan as opposed to if they're long-wise, it's just, it works well. I know people do it, but in my head, it's just easier to think of them as those short, you know, or as like a field individually. Um, and then the other reason is for things like um, in the spring, summer, and fall when we have trellis crops like tomatoes and eggplant, I'm sorry, tomatoes and cucumbers, if we run them north south, we get less shading. Um, and we also get the sun hitting on both sides of the plant as, it, as the sun moves throughout the day. So it's kind of the same way we think about in the northern areas of planting, you know, we think of apple trees or, or other fruit trees in north-south rows. Again, they work both ways. I don't think there's one way that's better than the other way. It's just what's worked well for our management. Um, and then do we provide any circulation? We've fooled around a little bit with, with half fans or the horizontal airflow fans, but we, uh, we haven't done them for the most part in ours. We have some vents in the peaks. Um, we've done butterfly vents and we've done some on thermostatically controlled shutters, but no fans that kind of open and close and can decrease that humidity in the, the winter. So here's some marketing options. All right, so we've got farmer's market, farm stand, CSA, restaurant, you know, institutional, which I kind of think of as semi-wholesale. You get a little, that might be things like schools or um, uh, prisons or, or similar hospitals, those kinds of things where you might get more than the wholesale price, but you're not getting a direct market price. And then, you know, web-based or email-based. So real quick with some pricing, these are kind of different ways to think about it. You know, there's a traditional, of you know, cost of production plus what we want to make, what other farmers are charging, um, what other outlets are charging, what you would pay. So you might say, well, I'd pay this much for a bag of lettuce, so that's what I'm going to charge, or what you want to make. And we've kind of put them all together, um, like a lot of people have, but we think a lot about what do we want to make. So if we say we want to make $20,000 gross in our hoop house, well, we can say that we have 20 beds. Um, so if we want to make $20,000 gross, each one of those beds needs to make $1,000 gross per year. If we say we can get four crops per bed, well, then each crop needs to make $250. So here's an example, and that kind of helps us to set our prices and see where we're at and make, make decisions about what we should and shouldn't grow. So here's an example with lettuce. We can get around 180 heads in a 30 by 3 foot bed. Um, we like to take about 80% of that and say that might be our yield. Um, if we're more than that, that's okay, but we like to estimate low. So that's 144 heads. If we need to make 250 um, in that bed with 144 heads, then we need to sell each of those heads for $1.74. We usually round up to $2. That's what our head lettuce price is. Um, and so that gets us at $288 per that bed for that crop. So we hit our 250 mark. Or we can think about it as, you know, per square foot, um, or we can think about it per square foot per time, which we won't get into today, but that's kind of the floriculture scheduling, too, of a, a dollars per square foot per day or per week. So if we think about, you know, baby salad mix, here's another example. If we mix it together and we get six, six pounds per one pound per six square feet, in 90 square feet, we get about 15 pounds. Um, so to get that $250, we'd have to sell it at $16.67 per pound. But we get three harvests from that, right? So if we have 15 pounds harvested three times, then we're more at 45 pounds. 
So for that then takes us, if we take that 1667 and divide it by three, we get to $5.55 per pound to hit that $250 that we were looking for. And then we do a lot of stuff like at the bottom there, well, if it was $6 or if it was $8 or if it was $10 or if it was 13 you know, you can kind of fool around with your prices and say, okay, well, you know, what can we charge? What can we make? And some of the things allow us to make more money, which allows us to grow things that might not make as much. Like radishes don't make us a ton of money, and they're really intensive, and it takes a while, but or it takes a long time to wash them and bunch them as compared to some other things. But people really like us to have radishes in our market. So they come and buy those radishes, and while they're there, well, then they buy, you know, baby salad, or they buy carrots, or they buy something else that may make us a little bit more money. So we might say that's a, a lost leader or, you know, something like that. And then, I know you can't see this on the screen also, but this is another one of the handouts. And this is kind of taking it all together and looking at our, you know, what our income potential or what our projection would be. So this is our actual plan from um, this spring. So you can see we have bed, we have the crop, we've got plant date, how many square feet, we've got some projected yields, we've got what our projected income is for what our prices are. Then we've got, you know, in the notes, whether it's the cultivar or how much of each is planted, and then assumptions are our bunches. So what we can start to do is add all this up and say, well, what should we make in this tunnel? And the number at the bottom, it's really important to say, you know, that it's, um, it's really important to say that it's, that's if we sold everything. So that $8,220 is if we sold everything. We know we're not going to sell every single thing coming out of there. So we like to estimate on the low side again. So if we sold 70% of that, we'd be more in the $5,750 range for gross in some really nice things, um, or some really, sorry, not some, some really assumptions that are pretty safe and that we feel comfortable from working with other farmers and their financials on, is that you know your net from gross is somewhere between 60 to that 65 to 75 percent. So if we took 70 percent of that 5750, we'd end up somewhere in the 4,000, a little over 4,000 dollar range for our net. Which for one piece, you know, one season. And then remember, we either have we get three crops, we're going to have two more seasons, or if we get four crops, we might have three more seasons. So then we can start, you know, kind of pushing and saying, well, what do, what do we want to grow? What do we need to grow? And, and how, how much can we expect to make? So I know that was probably a lot of information really quickly. Um, why don't we answer one more question here from Jim at the bottom. It says, what's our compost made of? And then, um, Jim, you can help me out. Or Liz, if, I, if I'm right, we have a few minutes to answer some questions. So our compost is made. Um, for the tunnels, we tend to avoid animal-based manure compost or animal animal manure-based compost. Not because there's anything wrong with animal animal-based compost. We use them in the field. We're really comfortable using them. We just put a bunch from our chicken coop onto um, where we planted garlic that's been composted and heated up three times now. So you know, I'm really comfortable using that. But um, we tend to not use animal-based compost because um, they're so high in soluble salts, and we don't get those that leaching um, that we do out in the field. So we get salt. We tend to have salt buildup. So our compost tends to be um, hay based for for our new or for our nitrogen. So and we tend to do either a two to one or three to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. So um, scratching it out here real quick on paper. So we'd have um, one bale alfalfa hay. Our first cutting hay, I'm sorry, one bale, first cutting hay, which for us is grass hay, so one bale grass hay, one bale alfalfa hay, or second or third cutting, um, two bales straw, two bales wood shavings, um, and then sometimes we put in um, two bales equivalent of leaves. So that would be three to one if our straw, wood shavings, and leaves are browns. Um, so that'd be three to one. Sometimes we'll leave out the leaves or we'll leave out of the out so that we're at a two to one. And then sometimes we add in a bale equivalent of peat, which helps really well with um, holding moisture. 
um, although peat's fairly expensive. And then we usually add in one bale equivalent or one bucket scoop of, uh, of soil, um, which is basically acting as an inoculant. So that's kind of the quick and dirty compost recipe. So let's look real quick here at some of the questions. Um, what kind of tool do we suggest for planting the smallest seed? So we use the six row Johnny's pinpoint seeder. It's expensive, it's an investment, um, but the rate that it puts it on, the uniformity um, is just, I think in my mind at least, it's, it's really, it's worth the investment in that. If you look at it as a way to invest in the, uh, in the, um, in what you're doing and invest on your farm. If it's $500, if we just looked at one bed of salamix can generate you know, 400, you can pretty easily get that, that money back. Um, so is that board insulation along the edges of the hoop house? It's a yes that it's hopefully being replaced in the next week or so, um, maybe two weeks. But what we have from what, we have a big pitch from one end to the other. So we have a three foot drop. Our tunnel's built level but our ground isn't, and to get it level, we would have had to scrape all of the topsoil from one end to the other end and have no topsoil left. So we uh, just used that for the winter to seal up, sort of seal up the distance between the baseboard and the ground on the end where it's off. So what we're doing is, is making our baseboards bigger before this winter comes. How far north are we? We are the colder part of zone five, um, arguably zone four, there's kind of, we're just north of Lansing and there's kind of this little pocket that's, that's consistently colder. So on the maps we're zone, zone colder part of five, but our temperatures would say we're zone four. Um, we do work with some farmers who are in the Upper Peninsula. Um, there's some farmers uh, in Marquette, Rudyard, Engadine, um, so in Munising and Bay Mills. So Munising and Marquette are you know, right on Lake Superior and Bay Mills as well. And they've been able to grow um, more or less all the way into De through December, and then they can start back up again in February. So, and they've been able to hold some root crops there. But they saw damage on, um, on uh, like the leafy crops in January. Um, do we periodically vent okay. the tongue? Oh. Adam, why don't you take a, yeah, why don't you go ahead and take one more question, Adam, and then we'll move on to Judd. Okay. Sounds good. So do we periodically vent the tunnel, even if it's cold outside, in order to reduce humidity? I would say yes, definitely, that that's something that is, is really important, that in the winter it, it does heat up. Um, I'm sorry, it does heat up, but it also um, gets really heavy, or really high humidity. And so we, uh, we do go ahead and vent. We set our thermostat for our shutters down to about 50, between 50 and 55. Well, thank you very much, everyone, and I'll turn it over to uh, to Judd here. <clears throat> Thanks, Adam. Um, hopefully, people can hear me now. I can hear myself. Um, waiting for my slides to come up. I hope everyone else enjoyed Adam's presentation as much as I did. I I did pick up a number of things in that presentation. Uh, very valuable tips for. Uh, growing in the winter time. Um, learned about a few new crops that I hadn't thought of before um, and appreciate Adam's excellent introduction. Okay, so my job this evening is to talk about uh, insects and mites in this system and Adam did make a valid observation which is that there is greatly decreased pest pressure when we grow in the winter time uh, than in the main season. Uh, however, we do have a few pests. Uh, first, we'll talk about some of the crops I'm going to focus on. Adam has hit on these. Turnips, radish, greens, carrots. And the pests I'm going to work with this evening is our aphids, thrips, slugs, and caterpillars. So we're here to talk about IPM, or Integrated Pest Management. And just like in the summertime, in the wintertime, we have a series of tools that we can use uh, to manage pests in our, uh, it says winter tunnel greens there, but um, as we've just learned, we're talking about way more than greens. We're also talking about some root crops. The first tool that I'd like people to think about is management of their summer crops. 
So as we grow a crop in the summertime, um, how is that affecting our wintertime pest levels? We could think about using biological control or the introduction of uh, beneficial insects and beneficial mites. We might ask the question, is there an appropriate role for pesticides in these settings? Are there resistant varieties? And then finally, um, maybe most importantly, can we rotate our soils or our tunnels or our crops uh, to reduce pests in our wintertime production? So let's begin with the first tool uh, of our IPM tools, which is management of warm season crops. And certain tunnel crops are much more attractive to pests than other ones. And I'll give you a, a very clear example is cucumbers. And the picture on the right hand uh, part of that slide shows a cucumber that is severely infested with two spotted spider mites. And you may have noticed that the title of my talk is, uh, I think it's something like insect and mite management because mites are technically not insects. And the truth is mites are a very minor pest in wintertime production. Uh, so we won't talk about those at all this evening. However, cucumbers are also very attractive for thrips and aphids. And aphids in particular can be a problem in the wintertime. If we look at peppers, we'll also find we get severe uh, aphid infestations on peppers. And then believe it or not, some people will use their tunnels to grow greens during the warm season uh, instead of, say, growing tomatoes or cucumbers. And greens attract aphids and cabbage worms, among other things, which of course affect our winter production. Uh, just to give you a close up of what some of these pests are, these are high tunnel tomatoes, and this is a severe infestation of spider mites, excuse me, of aphids and white flies. So one of the tricks is learning to recognize these symptoms in the summertime. Here is mite and thrips damage on high tunnel cucumbers. And here's a beautiful pepper crop. And I just couldn't find a good uh, picture of, of aphids on peppers. Uh, but peppers are attractive to aphids. And then summer greens um, can be a, actually a fairly profitable crop when grown inside a tunnel in the summertime. Uh, and this is from the northern part of my state, that's New York. Uh, this is probably a zone three. This is a, a, a farmer that's right in the middle of the mountains of northern New York. And he's able to grow quality greens throughout the summertime inside of his tunnel uh, because it never gets very hot there. And it's a very profitable crop. The problem is those crops are very attractive to the same pests that are going to bother us all wintertime long. So the message I would give to people is not to grow during the summertime. Um, I think you can grow uh, summertime crops in the same tunnel that you grow wintertime crops. But the main thing to do is to scout those crops. That's a very important part of integrated pest management is scouting and knowing what are your pest populations there. And in this photo, you can see a springtime crop of determinate tomatoes with a petunia hanging basket crop grown over top. Now those petunia hanging baskets are uh, also kind of high potential for uh, thrips, uh, mites, aphids, not only to that tomato crop, but also to the wintertime crop that will follow. So scouting is essential when you're growing your warm season crops. OK, these are the uh, winter crops. And another tool I'd like to talk to you about is biological control. And in this sense, biological control is the use of beneficial insects or beneficial mites, which we can break into predators versus parasitoids. And the predators can be thought of as specialists versus generalists. Biological control is often promoted. It's very well researched in what we call CEA, or Controlled Environment Agriculture, which refers to high-tech greenhouses with lighting uh, and with heating and with venting. And those lights and the heat work for biological control because they prevent 
the beneficials from going into what's called diapause or dormancy. High tunnels are very different. Um, we just saw a number of slides from Adam where there was snow on top of the um, high tunnels. And most of our biological controls are not going to take those temperatures well at all. So biological control has to be used preventatively and very early for winter tunnel crops. And Adam mentioned that some of his winter crops, for example, carrots, he is seeding in August. Um, and you can still use biological controls successfully in August and September uh, in the northern half of the US. Beyond that, you're going to have some issues. Okay, moving ahead. Let's talk about parasitoids. Uh, a parasitoid or a parasite uh, is an insect that somehow its life cycle impairs the life cycle of um, the pest that we're trying to control. And in the background, you can see uh, lettuce and some spinach inside of a wintertime high tunnel. And in the foreground, you can see two bottles labeled herbipar and aphipar. And those are two different parasitoids that attack aphids. And if you look closely here, this is one of our wintertime crops. I'm, it's one of the Asian greens. I'm not sure which. Could be, could be uh, topsoy maybe. Um, and if you look closely, you'll see an aphid infestation throughout this leaf. If we're going to control pests, we have to know what we, they look like. That's what I'm trying to do with this slide. So there's aphids on a winter green. And this is one of those parasitoids that came in the bottles that we saw two slides ago. And you can see the very small wasp on the right hand side of that photo is laying an egg inside of a pea aphid. And that's the parasitism. Now what happens is that egg turns into a baby wasp, which of course kills its host, in this case the aphid, and the host dies. And it leaves what we call a mummy, an aphid mummy, which are these small brown dots that you can see on this transplant flat. On this transplant uh, flat. So this example I'm giving to you comes from, um, those are pansies, I think, uh, or maybe petunias. It's a spring bedding plant. I just didn't have a good slide on winter greens uh, showing that parasitism. But you'll notice there, I wrote on that slide, is this a biological control success or not? Because if we're selling a crop where we eat the leaves, is this something we can give to our customers? So yes, we successfully controlled the pest uh, using a, a paras parasitoid, uh, but we've created something that really is not sellable. So we need to think very hard about the type of biological controls we're going to use. Also, will those biocontrols work uh, in a cold environment? I'd like to talk now about pesticides. And probably the most important point this evening is that pesticide regulations vary from state to state. And you need to ch check with your local extension office to see what is legal and effective. And I know we have at least one person listening from Ontario, so I should say that pesticide regulations vary from province to province, as well as state to state. Um, for example, in New York, where I live, we have a state law that allows us to use field pesticides inside of high tunnels as long as the size are rolled up. The regulation goes on to state, however, we're prohibited from using any product which says on the label, uh, not for use in greenhouses. So that puts us in the wintertime into a difficult situation because we roll up the sides very rarely um, on a high tunnel in the wintertime. We often try to ventilate in uh, smaller doses uh, through uh, a louver, uh, through uh, top vents, maybe through a crack in a door. But opening up sides fully to use uh, for a pesticide spray in the wintertime is really very impractical. So for the sake of this presentation, I focused on what I'll call softer materials and also ones that all have a greenhouse registration. But I can't emphasize enough, check with your local authorities what you're allowed to use. 
in order to illustrate some of the pesticides that we might consider using in winter production, we need to uh, use some real life examples. And here's one slug damage. You can see on this radish, just a small hole there. And I don't have a great picture of a slug uh, in this presentation, but I'm sure you can all imagine what a slug looks like. And it's feeding there on that radish. It will also feed on greens. It will also feed on uh, turnips and carrots. And slugs will not only feed on the surface or the top of that root crop, it will, they will feed below the surface. And they do not go away, at least where I live, in the wintertime. They continue to feed on our crops. The reason I start with this one is because there's a very easy control measure, an easy pesticide to use, and it also comes in a organic form. Um, iron phosphate is uh, labeled for controlling slugs, and it does a very good job, particularly when it's used preventatively. And here you can see we've used some iron phosphate to control the slugs. Those are the small pellets you see here on these leaves, and I think these are turnip leaves. So, and these leaves we just we weren't selling. We're only going to sell the the root off of these. But you can see that's actually a problem if you had to apply that to say uh, a baby lettuce mix like we saw in the last presentation. This would actually ruin the crop. So an important point for using iron phosphate is to use it very early or between cuttings. And this is some Asian green. I think it's one called Ruby Streaks, if I'm not mistaken. It is a mustard. And you can see here we applied it after we had harvested. To, and this way we avoided having any of that residue on the crop. And I have trials going with uh, maybe half a dozen growers this year looking at pest management in winter crops. And we have slug damage at every one of those sites. And I think from now on I will probably recommend people to put down iron phosphate preventatively uh, in the uh, mid-fall when the canopy is still fairly open. Uh, let's con now let's uh, use another pest to look at some different pesticides. Um, aphids. We got a question. I'll, I'll answer it. Uh, Jim Jasinski is asking: Can washing remove aphids or sluggo pellets? Um, that's a great question. Aphids, no. Those uh, you can remove live aphids with washing. Some of them. But a parasitized aphid, no. Part of that process is that the aphid uh, becomes, in a sense, glued to the leaf, and he he will not wash. It will not wash off. Um, sluggo pellets, yes, they could. But once they con contact water, they become a bit mushy. So it'd be better to brush them off uh, than to try and wash them off. Uh, some aphid pesticides, and aphids in particular, are a problem in winter greens because. They continue on those greens, and on a warm day, they'll be somewhat active. But when it's very cold, they just kind of sit there, but they don't die. Um, so some of the products we have on hand, we could use neem products. Uh, those do depend a little bit on temperature. Horticultural oil is possible, but there's a very high risk for burning. And then we could look at um, Botanigard or Mycotrol. We'll talk about those in a moment. Botanic Guard or Mycotrol are both a natural disease of aphids. And we can see here the Latin name of that fungus. It's called Bavaria bassiana. And it comes in at least two formulations. This one is organic or OMRI certified. It's called Mycotrol. And we're running some trials with that this uh, winter time. And the conventional formulation is called Botanic Guard. And this works by infecting the aphid's body with a fungus. Here's a couple of the other products we're investigating. Moltex, this one is not organic, but it is pending OMRI certification. This is a, an extract of neem oil. And then SUF oil is a OMRI certified oil that we can use. These are all aphid control products. Moving on to another pest that will allow us to talk about pesticides. I like to talk about cabbage worms. 
there are at least three different major uh, cabbage worms, the imported cabbage worm, the diamondback moth, um, and the cabbage looper. And in this photo, we can see a imported cabbage worm. And this, we have to remember that a lot of what we're growing for the Asian grains are related to cabbage. In fact, we learned about one called Tokyo Kana, which is a type of non-heading Chinese cabbage. So these crops are very attractive to these different cabbage worms. And in case you don't know what it looks like, this is the frass or droppings of those caterpillars, those worms. And you can also see the damage that they make there. The, also, the presence alone of those worms is a damage to the crops. Um, so what can we use? We have the uh, BTs, which is, again, a, a naturally occurring um, toxin or pathogen of the worms. Commercial formulations are Dipel, Javelin. And the nice thing is they have a greenhouse label. They have a very short re-entry re re interval, and there's no pre-harvest interval. The only drawback is that these products generally are considered more effective at warmer temperatures. So again, they need to be applied early. Resistant varieties. There are some varieties we know are more attractive to aphids than others, and we're continuing to research that. And if people have uh, information on what they think is resistant, I would appreciate hearing that. Finally, I'd like to talk about rotation. Um, thrips, mites, aphids, worms, slugs, they all overwinter very easily in our tunnels uh, as far north as anyone who's listening to this webinar. Rotating to fresh soil is probably one of the best IPM tools, but the least often practiced. Rotation could mean moving the tunnel or rotating the crops within the tunnel. And there are a lot of tunnels that are uh, becoming more popular that are mobile, like this, that can go over fresh soil. And that's a very important IPM tool. Or we can think about rotation within the tunnel, which we have here, which is a cover crop of triticale, oats, and vetch coming before a winter greens crop. So this farmer has a very successful uh, outside produce line that keeps him busy in the summertime. And he maintains his high tunnel just for winter crop production and always has a cover crop in there. And these cover crops can break up the life cycles of a number of pests. So to review the integrated pest management for winter tunnel crops, we have to scout our summer crops and control pests there. We can consider biological control if we use it preventatively and early. Most of our pesticides, particularly the organic ones, are a bit temperature dependent. We still need to do some research on resistant varieties and so soil or tunnel rotation is essential for IPM, and so as well as soil fertility, which I'm not discussing. However, the common theme to all of those tools, almost all of them, is that they have to be implemented early. If you find that your crop is infected in December with aphids, it'll be very hard to control them. So at this point, I'd like to say thanks for biocontrol. How long does it take the eggs to hatch? Um, so that's a, that's a good question. It depends a lot on the biocontrol that we're using. Oh, okay. So the, the parasitoids that I use, those eggs hatch, I think, in about, um, I want to say a week during warm weather. So ideally, I would suggest using those by scouting, um, scouting, say, your summertime crop in late August and September, releasing then. Other, there are other types of biocontrol, such as, uh, such as predators, and they also tend to work in temperatures well above freezing. And the thing to remember with these winter crops is that they will be freeze many times. I'm going to move on to the next question, which comes from UW River Falls. Do you use cover crops as a bed rotation during the season? Um, we don't. I know other people do. Um, so I guess the idea there is having a cover crop in one bed and then, say, having another bed uh, used for uh, a cash crop of some, of, some, of some type. 
that would work very well, particularly for, say, um, diseases. I'm not supposed to be talking about diseases, but let's say you could do a biofumigation type crop or something along those lines in there. The problem is with mobile pests, let's say an aphid, uh, and aphids are, are mobile, so they could uh, easily reinfect the area that you're cover cropping. Um, so no, I prefer cover cropping or crop rotation as a total change in the type of crop I'm growing. So if I'm growing uh, vegetable crops, I prefer growing something like a grass or a legume or clover that a, has a totally different pest cycle. Uh, moving on to the next question from Peter. Is mycotrol OMRI listed? Yes, mycotrol is OMRI listed. That is the aphid um, uh, pesticide that we discussed. And we are using that inside of high tunnels now. The conventional uh, type, the conventional version is called Botanigard, but Microtrol is OMRI listed, yes. From Nadine, Spinosad is a new OMRI listed pesticide that seems to have controlled cabbage worms in the field. Have you tried it inside? Nadine, that's an excellent question. Spinosad, um, which uh, was known as Spintor, and has now been uh, slightly uh, re, um, uh, has been a new version of it has come out and it's called Radiant, um, uh, but it's uh, a very similar chemical. So Spintor is going away, it's being replaced by Radiant. And the OMRI listing of Spinosad is called Entrust. So we have Entrust, Spintor, and Radiant. Radiant and Spintor, which are the conventional forms of Spinosad, and they are really a very nice chemical in that it's very soft on beneficials, yet it is very highly effective against cabbage worms. They have on their label that it is prohibited from greenhouse use. And I checked with uh, the representatives from that company um, last week, and they, they uh, confirmed that, um, that Radiant and Spintor cannot be used inside of greenhouses, which most people would interpret as tunnels as well. In trust, I'm still waiting on that to learn whether that is labeled for uh, greenhouse use or not, and that is the OMRI version, but I cannot recommend it, uh, and the company has not gotten back to me on whether that's allowed for greenhouse use. It is prohibited from greenhouse transplant use. My okay, question is you, whether Jeff, it's prohibited from greenhouse food great production presentation. And I see our next speaker our is ready, presentation uh, is, so I'm uh, going to sign off. Hazelrig Thanks, everyone. From the University of Vermont, and she'll be talking about disease management in winter greens including cultural controls, pesticide use, and organic methods. And you have 20 minutes and five minutes of questions, so go ahead and begin. OK, great. Thank you very much. Um, and I've got the same disclaimer as Adam. I'm not a doctor, although I do play one on TV sometimes. Um, so let's get started. Yeah, I'm going to cover disease management and uh, I will probably, um, Adam and Judd both made good points that I'll try to um, uh, bring up again in, in my talk. So we've been talking tonight about using high tunnels. There are lots of pros uh, to using high tunnels. Um, Adam told us you know, how great it is. Uh, they're an important component of diversified farms. You can get earlier crops, later crops, um, better markets. And the, um, as far as plant diseases are concerned, that we can manipulate heat, water, humidity, and temperature to optimize plant growth in these high tunnels. And we can also avoid a lot of common field diseases, disease problems, because we have no rain. Um, so that's a great uh, uh, reason to use these high tunnels and um, make them very efficient as far as diseases go. Now, the problem is that there are some disease cons with using high tunnels, too. The humid conditions created that um, Judd was talking about and Adam a little bit in these high tunnels are great for several other diseases. We may not see the same ones that we see out in the field, but there are some ones that are really common for high tunnels. And as Judd was also mentioning, rotation is really tough in greenhouses. Um, and it is good now that we can move, you know, we've got some of these greenhouses on rollers and we can move them. That's really helpful. But a lot of our greenhouses still in Vermont or high tunnels aren't moving. So rotation is tough and disease management is a little tougher that way. 
the very first step in trying to manage diseases and or pests is be prepared. You know, always be ready for problems. And as Judson uh, um, mentioned, scouting is really important. And the earlier you find a problem, the easier it is to fix it. And uh, I'm a great proponent of using tools and books with lots of pictures. Also, the web is a great source of information, especially when you go to uh, university websites. Um, a lot of the state's veg guides are excellent uh, resources also. A really good resource that I use a lot and we really promote among our Vermont growers is this Diseases and Pests of Vegetable Crops in Canada. Uh, I actually buy them in bulk and then sell them uh, at cost uh, to growers. I think the cost is around $55. But it's an excellent um, book, especially since it's from Canada. You know, usually all these books, uh, ID books come from Florida and places like that. And for our northern growers, it's really nice that um, uh, a lot of the diseases discussed are the same ones that we have. So this may be good for some of your growers, too. Um, but take advantage of some of these tools that are out there. Um, get your plant problems identified and diagnosed. It can be really tricky, and it can even be tricky for a plant pathologist. So um, sometimes a lot of leaf spots look the same, and you need a professional to take a look under a microscope. So it's a good value to uh, every state has a plant diagnostic clinic, and make sure you use them. OK, so let's talk about plant diseases. Plant pathologists like to uh, discuss this concept called the disease triangle. And it's really a good concept because for any plant disease to happen, you have to have three uh, things present. You have to have the proper environment for the disease. You have to have a susceptible host present. And you have to have the pathogen present. And the way you can manage plant diseases is by manipulating one of those legs of the triangle or eliminating uh, one of those legs. And you can eliminate plant disease. So we'll go through and look at some different problems and look and see how we can manipulate this disease triangle to manage the plant disease. But basically, uh, greenhouse disease management is basically moisture management. And I would say that you rarely would ever have to spray a fungicide in a, in a high tunnel or a greenhouse, that it can all be done with moisture management. So um, let's talk about how to do moisture management. Um, first of all, I'd like to cover how, well, plant diseases are caused by a lot of different organisms, bacteria, fungi, viruses, nematodes. But by far, the biggest problem we have in greenhouses on uh, plants are caused by um, fungi. And fungi, um, you know, we're all familiar with you know, toadstools or mushrooms. That's a fruiting body of a fungus. And plant pathogenic fungi work the same way. It's just that the fruiting bodies are microscopic. So um, let's take a, a really common disease that we see on spinach, beets, and Swiss chard. You may see this in a high tunnel, too, but I also saw it. It's really common. Um, it's a late summer disease outdoors. And it's a fungal leaf spot uh, causes, um, caused by Cercospora. And it causes this small leaf spot with a dark purple um, halo to it. Now, if you looked closely at that, you'd see these little black pinpoint um, they're actually fruiting bodies in the center of that lesion, just like that mushroom, but just but microscopic. So if we look closer at that under a microscope, you see the fruiting body of that fungus. Uh, it's called a pseudostromata. Um, and the spores of that fungus are born on that fruiting body. And these spores are windblown and water splashed um, and carried around the greenhouse um, by tools uh, and, and wind. So these spores are carried around the greenhouse on winds or outdoors on wind. They land on a, on a leaf. If they land on a, um, if it's a beet disease and they land on a, a tomato leaf, they're going to die. Because most of these fungi are very host specific. Something that attacks a spinach will probably not attack a tomato. 
Also, if the spore lands on the soil, it's just going to die. But if, the, if a beet pathogen lands on a beet leaf, uh, it will recognize that as a host, and it can start to germinate. Now, what happens with almost all fungi requires six to eight hours of leaf wetness or high humidity to germinate. And that's the important thing with high in high tunnels. Um, but any way that we can limit this leaf wetness or high humidity, these spores will not germinate. So that's what we're trying to control. And that's what uh, you know moisture management is all about, is stopping these spores from germinating. Also, if you used a fungicide on a plant, what happens is you're coating that leaf um, with a fungicide, that spore would land on the leaf. And even if you got that leaf wetness, that fungicide provides a barrier so that that spore can't grow through it and germinate into the plant tissue. Um, so that's how a fungicide works. OK, so say that you've got this happy little spore. It's germinated. It's had leaf wetness. It's growing through all those plant cells and feeding on those plant cells. And then what we see is you know, these collapsed brown cir circular spots. Uh, on the foliage. And if the conditions are right, you know, once the, the fungus gathers enough nutrients, it will again produce more fruiting bodies and more spores and just keep the cycle moving. So that under the right conditions of high humidity or leaf wetness, we see more and more of these leaf spots uh, cropping up. And if you have the right conditions, new leaf spots, a spore can land on a leaf and cause a leaf spot and produce another spore. You know, all it takes is five to seven days for that whole cycle to, um, to uh, repeat itself. So it really can spread quickly if you have the right environmental conditions. So these spores and these fungi um, also will overwinter and on the diseased refuse or the old leaves uh, in the greenhouse. So an important a uh, management tool to use in high tunnels and greenhouses is to remove all the plants at the end of the season or any plant debris, clean up the greenhouse thoroughly after each production cycle, because that fungus can overwinter on that tissue and build up over time. So you know, if we think of it in terms of the disease triangle, you're eliminating that pathogen. Uh, you're manipulating the pathogen um, by tilling it in and getting it to decompose so it won't become a problem again or uh, won't be a green bridge uh, for the next crop. OK, so let's talk about lowering humidity and leaf wetness, because that really is the key to controlling plant diseases in the high tunnel or greenhouse. And right off the bat, you want to choose a well-drained site for your greenhouse, nothing that uh, would where water would puddle or uh, drain poorly, because that's just asking for problems. Also, you want to make sure you um, orient your greenhouse the right direction so that you're getting winds through the house as you roll up the sides and things like that. So make sure you put uh, the greenhouse in the right place and, and orient it correctly. The other thing you want to do, I think Adam and Judson were both talking about this, to lower humidity, you roll up sides. You've got to get that air moving through there. Ridge venting is really important, opening up the top to let moisture out. And then also, you know, it's not so important in the, in the wintertime, but keeping plants and weeds down around the outside of the greenhouse just so you know, air can move through easily is really important. Um, I also work with lots of farmers in Vermont that you know they plant uh, their high tunnels and you know they see a little bit of uh, space that's empty. Well, why not put some extra cucumbers in there? But in the long run, sometimes it's best to keep things well spread out. Uh, you'll have fewer disease problems um, down the road if you keep things well spaced and and so that there can be good air circulation and things can dry off rapidly. You want to lower uh, humidity and leaf wetness also by using fans. I think somebody, a farmer, had asked that question, um, whether uh, Judd ventilated or Adam ventilated. And yes, it's an important tool. Fans in the end walls, hanging box fans um, you know, all along the house will help. And sometimes you know, it's just so humid out or wet that sometimes we have to both heat 
and ventilate at the same time to drive that moisture out, which seems a little counterintuitive, but it is really important sometimes to vent and, and turn up the heat just to dry things off. And I do see a question here. Somebody asks, uh, what do you consider uh, high humidity to be? Typically, anything above 85% will, will create a problem. So if you can keep things around 80, that's good. Uh, you want to plant uh, space plants for good air circulation. And most of you for these um, winter crops will be planting right in the ground. But you know, space things. Don't pack everything in, because the quicker you can get things to dry off, the less problem you'll have with uh, these foliar diseases. And then also, you might find that you know, in the fall, when you know, humidity is high and it's, it's tough to dry things out, you may find that you don't plant as densely um, in high tunnels or in, uh, with hoop houses and things like that. So be ready to amend your planting practices just so you can really watch the leaf wetness. OK, some of the fungal diseases uh, in winter crops that will be decreased by lowering uh, relative humidity or leaf wetness would include that Cercospora leaf spot uh, that I was talking about earlier on spinach, beets, and chard, um, Stemphilium leaf spot of spinach, Cladosporium leaf spot in spinach, some of the downy mildew diseases in spinach and basil, all of the botrytis diseases um, are due to leaf wetness or especially high humidity, Alter alternaria leaf spots of carrots. So really, um, you know, without going through the specifics on each one of those diseases, which would cause you guys to just glaze over, I'm sure, um, all of those will benefit by lowering humidity and, and drying out foliage as fast as possible. Um, so most of these diseases can be managed with a combination of through proper humidity and moisture control, also eliminating that overwintering material. And um, you know how, uh, I guess, Adam was doing things in those small beds. Once you're done with a bed, you've harvested everything you're going to harvest in that, make sure you till it under. Get that material you're not going to uh, use anymore underground and decomposing quickly so it doesn't uh, be a sink for your healthy crops coming along maybe a little bit later. Also, another good tool to use with a lot of these um, diseases is starting with good, clean seed. And that's really important, because some of these fungal diseases can be carried on on the seed. Use of resistant cultivars and varieties is also a really good tool to use uh, in disease management. And in the case of the disease triangle, what you're trying to do is you're manipulating that host so that if you choose, you know, downy mildew might be a problem on spinach, but if you choose a resistant cultivar, um, you can, even though the pathogen and the environment might be perfect, you've chosen a resistant host, so you will not have that disease problem. So always, when you're choosing varieties, um, look for resistance. I think it's really a good idea to keep good records uh, with the varieties you're using and what problems you're seeing so that you can always be looking for um, some resistance out there. OK, the use of fungicides in high tunnels and greenhouses. Like I mentioned, fungicides would only be used as a last resort uh, and only after resolving any moisture issues. And I really do think that by good ventilating and moisture management, you can avoid almost all of the disease problems in, in high tunnels and greenhouses. So that should really be your, your approach. And I know a lot of our growers in Vermont have um, bought uh, equipment to measure humidity and really track humidity in the greenhouses. And that's, uh, I think that's money well spent. Um, if you do need to use a fungicide, uh, the available products will be listed in your state's veg guide and also with your agency of ag. And if you're organic, check with your certifying agency. Like um, Judd was saying, it is tricky. 
uh, because in Vermont, uh, our Vermont Agency of Ag, our current position on greenhouse application of pesticides uh, is in accordance with the FIFRA Section 2 EE that says a label does not have to specify greenhouse as a site provided the crop is on the label in order to use the product in a greenhouse. So as long as uh, tomato is listed um, on the label of that fungicide, you can use it. Um, so just make sure you check with your, all states are a little bit different, so make sure you're in accordance with the law in your state. Okay, we've talked about foliar problems and moisture management. Well, that really the same thing goes for uh, uh, soil-borne diseases and root rots. Uh, it is basically moisture management again. And I know a lot of us, you know, when we have cool, wet conditions, that's when uh, damping off can really be a problem in greenhouse. And that causes a rotting of the uh, roots under the soil or a crown rot right at the um, at the soil level, and it can either attack the seed uh, the, right after it germinates or after it emerges. And there are several different fungi that can cause this. Uh, they're present basically in all soils, but um, when you have cool, wet conditions, um, it, you're not favoring the crop, but you're favoring these pathogens. So. Um, anything you can do to avoid the cool, wet conditions and speed or favor crop germination will help you avoid this problem. Um, if you are transplanting, make sure when you use flats or pots, make sure they're sterilized with 10% bleach or another suitable cleaner. Um, you can use soilless mixes or um, a highly biologically active mix, too, will be um, helpful. Also, uh, soil amendments are a tool that you can use. There are two different product, products. One is Root Shield, the other is Soil Guard, and they're both OMRI approved. Um, Root Shield uh, is a Trichoderma harzianum uh, fungus, and it controls Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Fusarium, and Sclerotinia, sold as either granules or a drench. And this can be incorporated into your um, Greenhouse soils, also the same with soil guards. So it is another tool that you can use if you seem to have repeated problems. But um, And a lot of our growers just use it sort of as a little insurance, I think. Or, uh, you know, it might help them to relax a little bit. Um, maybe, maybe the placebo effect, I'm not sure. But uh, it does, it will help with uh, root rots. Um, I did mention that uh, rotation can be a problem. It's tough to move houses that are um, you know, set in one place. And if you can't rotate, make sure you keep your soils biologically active. And Judd was talking about that exact same thing by adding in composts um, and then rotating, you know, putting in other crops uh, that are not in the same family, rotating out of that crop using cover crops. So, Make sure you do think of how to keep that soil biologically active and not let certain pests um, build up over time. But the best thing you can do is to um, move, the, move the hoop houses uh, on that roller system. is a great new innovation, I think. OK. So uh, just, uh, just to wrap up, to manage diseases in high tunnels, Proper ID is really important. Use your plant diagnostic clinics. You can mail them samples, and they can get back to you pretty quickly on exactly what the disease problem is. Make sure you keep good records so you know what your repeat problems are. Um, when you're trying to manage diseases, think about that plant disease triangle and manipulate the environment, the host and the pathogen, uh, one way or another, either through uh, lowering humidity and starting with good, clean seed, choosing resistant varieties and cultivars. Bottom line is moisture management. I can't stress that enough. Um, think of that little baby in diapers. It's all about moisture management. Um, clean up the debris and plow under when the crop is finished so you don't get that pathogen just hanging around wet, re ready to infect the next uh, planting that you put in. 
and rotate houses if possible, and a two-year minimum would be best. Or if you can't do that, keep soils biologically active so that they can really um, uh, uh, compete with some of those the bad guys. And let's. So I think that is my last. Twenty-nine. Yes, uh, I guess my last slide was just thanking you for your attention. Um, let's see. I, I see a question here, if relative humidity is a major issue, would a dehumidifier help? I think that's a little bit cut off. Um, sure, a dehumidifier would help, but that would be a pretty expensive um, way to dehumidify, I would imagine. I think by venting and fans and opening up the house, it would be a lot cheaper. Um, during greenhouse cleanout, do you recommend sanitizing the structure itself? Uh, I don't think that's necessary. I think uh, it's more important just to um, make sure you till the crop under and uh, get it decomposing. You know, maybe it's you know greenhouse sanitizing may be more important if bacterial diseases were involved, and I would be more. Um, concerned about that maybe with something like bacterial canker in tomato, but I don't think for the greens, I don't think bacterial diseases are such a big problem that you would need to really sanitize the structure. It's just all about not creating those environmental conditions where those pathogens really become a problem. So it really, it, moisture management is the best thing you can do. Uh, do I know of any computer programs that work with uh, work with a sensor to track greenhouse based on yes I well you know what I know our growers have purchased them and I don't know I don't know the specific ones they have purchased I think that's probably something maybe we could look into and post it later but I know our growers in Vermont have been really happy and have felt like they it's been money well spent on when they've purchased the um, those computer-based systems to monitor our age. Do you recommend that all tunnels have yeah. some form of venting? Uh, yes, definitely. I think um, I think it's it's key when you're do, dealing with diseases. You've got to have some sort of venting, either being able to roll up the sides, uh, put in fans. Ridge vents are are great, um, but yes, I think venting of some sort is key to manage plant diseases in a high tunnel. OK, and we've uh, more or less run out of question and answer time, but okay. uh, you did a great job. Uh, the, uh, the note there. Um, we're dealing with post-harvest handling and storage management, which uh, I believe is a very important topic to, to many of the folks that are on the line this evening. And, and Adam and Judd and, and Ann did an excellent job of setting the tone for some of the comments that I will be sharing with you over the next 15 minutes or so. Um, and I do encourage you to type questions, because if they are not answered uh, this evening directly, we will be able to address them as time goes forward. My presentation will have two sections. Uh, the first will emphasize 10 principles. And then the second will emphasize 10 guidelines. And I'd like to make uh, three, three particular comments about, uh, about the principles and guidelines. First, I am going to touch on examples uh, coming from year-round use of the high tunnel, both, uh, say, the main season and the fall-winter season, which we are talking about this evening. I'm also going to try to share with you principles and guidelines that apply to nearly all crops, rather than just uh, the winter greens and, and other uh, types of leafy vegetables, which we have focused on so far this evening. Uh, the comments that I'll share with you are, are going to be of a summary overview nature. Uh, these are take-home messages, if you will, that I believe most anyone will be able to apply in, in some way, shape, or form. And um, I may be preaching to the choir on some of them, as I know that many of you are experienced uh, growers and marketers, and so you have encountered some post-harvest handling and storage management questions and issues in your time already. But I do hope to uh, give you some food for thought, as I've been given food for thought throughout this, this webinar. So uh, to begin, I'd like to offer an observation. Um, in many years, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with quite a range of growers uh, throughout the US 
in both fresh market and processing uh, operations. And it's it's just been uh, my casual observation in that time that that many uh, overlook the importance of post-harvest handling and and uh, storage, uh, which is occasionally surprising when one considers uh, all of the facets that you need as farmers and marketers need to bring together to be successful. Certainly, there's the genetic component. Uh, there are horticultural components. There are aspects of crop protection and dealing specifically with disease management, certainly with entomology, which, again, we've heard uh, a lot of good things about this evening. And there are, obviously, even in high tunnels, some disease, or I'm sorry, some weed science issues to contend with as well. But one of the last pieces, I feel, is, is the post-harvest handling and storage. And, and while uh, most people uh, often take it for granted that if they produce a high-quality crop uh, in abundance, that they will be able to take most or all of that to market, um, I, I, I am familiar with, and I'm sure you may be familiar with, examples of, of where this has simply uh, not been the case. I'd like to emphasize also that handling and storage are not necessarily the same thing, that as you get into the uh, production guides and bulletins and fact sheets and the like dealing with these topics, you will find them handled uh, separately. Post-harvest handling uh, and information sources, you have a variety of information uh, sources that you can, you can um, work with. And I'm here, of course, as a representative of the last, the university system, but certainly you have your own experience to draw on and the experience of other growers many members of, uh, of the equipment trade that might want to sell you a refrigerated unit or a dehumidifier or a humidifier, as it might be, consultants. My advice would be for you to listen carefully to all of them and then make uh, your, your best judgment on what, what is needed. And I'll just say from the outset that there are many excellent references and educational programs on, in the area of post-harvest handling and storage management. Some of these references, of course, are online, and, and many are free or very inexpensive. And I have listed at the end of this presentation uh, four to five slides of um, example references for, for you to peruse uh, after, the, after the presentation or any time that would make sense for you. So 10 principles to, to uh, uh, consider as you uh, work with the crop after harvest. Um, I certainly don't need to remind uh, the experienced growers among us that buyers do differentiate their suppliers based on quality, uh, oftentimes because, frankly, there is enough crop to go around. Uh, crop surpluses are common. So when that is the case, um, so buyers are at the, uh, have the opportunity to separate their suppliers based on the quality of the product that the, the suppliers are able to provide. Uh, secondly, uh, the perspectives on quality vary depending on uh, your particular role in the food system. If you are a farmer, um, you have a particular uh, perspective on product quality that is that is uh, derived mainly from producing a, an abundant high quality crop and providing it to your market. But those who eat it or process it or somehow uh, in some other way work with it often have a different perspective on quality and it's uh, your job to to merge them as well, essentially, as, as the farmer or supplier. Now, again, the many experienced growers on the line this evening recognize that the concerns of their market pretty much trump the concerns of any farmer when it comes to uh, assessing how the crop should be produced and, and packaged and delivered. In other words, the buyer's concerns over the value that they are receiving for the product trump your concerns as a grower over the questions you have about yield and revenue and the like. And, and uh, this is sometimes a bitter pill to swallow, um, uh, but it, it, uh, it is uh, unfortunately uh, pretty much an unavoidable aspect of the, of the market. And when buyers are presented with the product, of course, they use a whole range of indicators in the four categories that are shown here to assess the quality of the product. And we will not dwell on any one of them uh, in particular this evening, but I want to give a very quick overview of, of some of those indicators of, of quality that fall into those uh, four categories. Now, of course, there are the physical characteristics of the crop, which I'm showing here, tomato as an example, just the size and the shape and the color, uh, firmness and so on of, of that product. These are all physical aspects of the, of the product's quality. There are other physical aspects that are becoming more and more important. And uh, for example, the lack of foreign material from the field or the storage in the product. Um, Certainly, if you pack that material, 
or other, somehow otherwise package it in a, in a shed or a barn or outdoors under the trees, um, there's a very uh, there's a probability that uh, some of the debris will fall from one of those areas and, and contaminate the product. And of course, to some buyers, this is simply um, not allowable. There's also the biochemical and sanitary aspects of quality, and and the need for the clean pro a clean product is very high. I'm showing uh, here on the picture on the left uh, what is a typical packing shed or, or sorting grading operation that. Uh, to many people's minds is is going uh, the way of the dinosaur. It simply won't be an option to maintain uh, packing sheds or sorting grading areas um, and and to uh, uh, have people in them uh, working as the as the two people are here today as shown in this image particularly the, the male um, to be uncovered or to not not be wearing uh, hair nets or to not ensure that birds are, are not doing business in, in, a, in a product is, is uh, simply becoming more and more difficult, as unfortunately many of you know. And this brings us to the, to the aspect of food safety, which is amongst a grower group, very, very unpopular um, um, subject, but I think it's one that is important for us to discuss in, in its relationship to post-harvest handling and storage. Uh, washing simply does not eliminate most pathogens, and so at all stages, uh, beginning with the farm and ending at the plate, we do take steps to prevent and reduce and educate folks on the need for a, a clean product. Whatever one's particular views are on who is responsible for what and what steps are, are viable and which steps are economical and which ones are fair, the reality is that um, we do need to take steps to, to provide as clean a product as possible to remain in the market. The fifth principle I'd like to, to emphasize this evening is, is that, of course, uh, post-harvest handling and storage is, is just one, but it is a very, very important uh, stage in delivering a high quality product to market. Um, again, this is uh, probably preaching to the choir for many of you, but uh, it, it bears, I think it bears repeating um, that, that it uh, does very little uh, good for anyone to produce a high quality product in the field and not be able to deliver that to market for some reason after harvest. Another, another principle that one should, should have before them as they contemplate um, you know, how to produce and, and market high quality crops is that quality is only lost. It is not regained during storage and handling. Uh, the product will never be uh, higher in quality than it is the, at the very moment that you harvest it or it is on the vine or it is in the raised bed. The quality of that product will only diminish with time. So steps that you take um, the moment beginning with harvest or the people you've hired take uh, the beginning with harvest are, are very, very key. Because of course you do have um, excellent skills at producing an extremely high quality product at the time that it is ready to harvest. It is there ready for you to pluck, uh, take from the vine, to clip from the bed, uh, to remove from the trellis, whatever the case might be, no matter what your crop. And it would be a shame that to experience uh, some of what I have seen through the years and perhaps what you have seen or experienced through the years that defects trace to, to after harvest handling or, or poor environmental management or, or some, some uh, factors such as that um, to take what is otherwise a very good crop and uh, essentially allow it to, to decline. There are some sources of physical or handler error, and, and I'm giving examples here of harvesting, uh, t mistiming the harvest, harvesting the crop when it is either immature or overmature, can uh, handling the product improper, improperly can cause it to be misshapen. I have seen, perhaps you have seen as well, dimples in fruit from, from one uh, from packing too deep in the box or, or bin or squeezing too tightly when harvested or, or moved. Um, this can worsen into bruises or cracks uh, due to drops or pressure uh, exerted on the fruits or, or the leaves. It can become worse even yet uh, with scrapes or cuts or tears caused by any sharp object really or even a corner in the, in the box. Uh, it doesn't take much especially with the uh, very tender leafy vegetable crops that we have been discussing so far this evening. And as Adam I'm, I'm sure can could elaborate on, uh, consistent with my experience that the harvest timing of the harvest is always key, but it's especially key in the fall and winter production because of uh, certain crops' sensitivity to cold. 
They may be cold, tolerant to the cold and freezing and thawing, as he described earlier, when fully alive. But if cut, um, or fully intact, but if cut could, uh, could diminish in quality. And I'll give one quick anecdote on that. And, and certainly, uh, if others on the line have experience with this, we'd, we'd certainly like to hear it. But it's been my experience with uh, many of the winter greens that, that uh, they must be cut only after they've thawed in the morning. So, um, for example, do not promise your market that you will have the product for them at 9 a.m. Uh, because it, the product may still be frozen on that December or January morning. And promise them instead to have it for them around lunchtime or later after it's had a time to thaw. Because if it's cut first thing in the morning when frozen, it will turn to cooked spinach um, a very short time thereafter. Whereas if it's allowed to thaw naturally, um, it will retain its uh, its high quality. Your job from harvest to display or delivery is uh, to manage the handling and storage operation so that you're able to provide that abundant high quality crop uh, to your market. And if you just pause, we're rushing through this, this particular um, summary of harvest and of handling and, and storage. But if you just pause for a moment and consider how many stages there are between harvest and display or delivery, you will, you will uh, appreciate even more, more fully how many uh, steps uh, must you know, there are and, and the steps that you must take to ensure that they are done properly. And the sources and types of post-harvest loss of a, of a biological nature are, are many. Uh, we can certainly have develop disease in storage. We can develop insect damage in storage. Even warm-blooded animals, uh, large and small, can wreak their havoc even uh, if the product is, is stored for a relatively short period of time. We need to guard against uh, damage due to these sources. Also, um, there's mismanagement of the environment, so to speak. And, and Anne did a phenomenal job, I believe, of, of uh, describing for you the environmental management that can, that can contribute or reduce uh, disease uh, in the crop. And because she's very focused squarely on the management of the environment, and in, when it comes to post-harvest uh, handling and storage, I say the same is absolutely true. Um, and uh, so to manage the, the post-harvest environment just as, you, just as rigorously as you may manage the pre-harvest environment is very, very important. I'll give one quick um, observation uh, because I believe it speaks to a question that somebody raised earlier about uh, venting the high tunnel for relative humidity control. Keep in mind that the outside air in a climate like ours in, in late fall or winter uh, may have a relatively high rel high relative humidity, but when that cold, dry air is brought into the high tunnel and allowed to heat, the relative humidity of that air will drop even further. So um, in a case where you are actually attempting to add um, uh, humidity to the environment, uh, you need to add, do that. So harvested products are living but in a compromised condition. Therefore, they have similar basic needs as intact crops uh, but require special attention. And we know what these major factors are affecting quality. And they vary by uh, situation according to crop and the variety and the market that you're, that you're working with. But they're all uh, summarized. And whether or not there are you know, conditions A or B or C, they can be categorized into uh, a warm storage, a cool storage, a dry storage, a wet storage. Uh, uh, will ethylene need to be removed? These are all major questions that uh, we can, or you know, questions that we can address with the storage management. And finally, the, final, the last principle I'd like to bring to your attention is that storage does open marketing windows for, for certain, because the longer one has the product to, to offer to the market, uh, the, the more they can lengthen their, their marketing window. However, um, storage has its own cost as well. And so what, what many folks who are uh, very familiar with this area suggest to growers is that they do the calculation of what of the difference between selling the, the product the moment is har it is harvested or with minimal storage versus the cost to them of selling the product later and incurring the cost of storage. And so in, in a sense, the moment you commit to, rent, to, to storing your crop, you are essentially buying it or renting it from yourself rather than accruing the revenue from selling it immediately. So. I, I see that we're getting down to uh, the uh, wire in terms of time. And so I'd like to just list these 10 guidelines provided by Dr. Marita Cantwell of the University of California Davis, just one of the uh, several 
uh, institutions across the country that excels in the area of post-harvest handling and storage management of vegetable crops. And these uh, 10 general guidelines are listed in both uh, the slide set that we're working with here and in your handout. So you can read them um, uh, at your leisure later on and refer to them. But she's encouraging folks to harvest at the correct stage and minimize the number of times the product is handled. Um, protect crop products from the sun or extreme environmental fluctuations and simplify the packing process. Uh, sort and classify and pack the products and place them in containers. Um, I'm not sure who's controlling the um, slides, but we'll just get, I guess, to the to the end point, which is um, pull the product as soon as possible after harvest and know the product's market in terms of size, ripeness, and handling. And, and finally, um, coordinate the post-harvest handling uh, so that it is efficient as rapid and it will uh, maintain product quality. So um, train and compensate your, the folks that work with you um, as well as you possibly can in terms of uh, their um, ability to handle the product uh, as it needs to be um, to ensure the highest uh, possible quality uh, as you go to the market. So we discussed 10 principles uh, this evening and very quickly ran through 10 guidelines. And I'd like to remind you that there are practical tools available to help growers handle the process and store crops on their farms. And uh, again, I will just leave you with uh, a, uh, uh, the listing of the, of the references or that, are follow, that follow on the next four to five slides. If there, are, if there is any time for questions, I'll be glad to address them. Matt, it looks like we've uh, pretty much run out of time, unfortunately. But if any questions do come across uh, the chat box, we'll be sure to get those to Matt so we can have a crack at answering those. Um, but this does bring us to the end of our third webinar. And I want to thank all the presenters uh, for their time and their expertise. Our next webinar will be November 16th, uh, which is next Wednesday at 1 PM Eastern Standard Time, which is noon Central Standard Time. The topic will be nutrition, water, and soil management in high tunnels. Uh, be sure to pay attention to the logon procedures for the fourth webinar because they're going to be a little bit different than the first three, three webinars. You'll have to have both a, a phone for the audio connection and an internet connection for the video feed. Uh, if you are able, uh, please click on the evaluation link on the current slide and give us your feedback about tonight's program, especially the last question of the survey which uh, concerns uh, any pest management or production challenges you are currently facing. Uh, this inf information is important for us for our future research and extension program. So uh, with that, I will bid everyone a good night. Thank you again for participating uh, with us. And we look forward to seeing you on November 16th for our fourth webinar series. Thank you very much, and have a good night. <laughs>